Today, we're going to be speaking about Oracle Forensics um, and specifically the dissection of an Oracle attack in the absence of auditing. Often in my uh, line of work, which to, uh, until, up until recent days has been more in the attack side of things, what we'll often find during those reviews after the, uh, a, a, su a successful penetration is that auditing was not enabled. So if auditing is enabled, then you know, the, the job of an Oracle Forensics Examiner is going to be that much easier. But if it's not enabled, how does one then go about gathering evidence after a, a, a compromise? Indeed, how do we know if there's been a compromise or not? So why, why Oracle Forensics? Well, since the, uh, the state of California passed SB uh, 1386 uh, back in 2003, another 34 states have followed suit. And there's legislation uh, currently, I don't know whether it's your House of Congress or, or the Senate, but they're, they're talking about enacting a federal law. And so the, the, the problem, well, not the problem, the idea behind these database um, security breach laws, or data breach laws even, are uh, that in the event of a customer's uh, personally identifiable, uh, identifiable information being stolen, they are to tell their customers of, of the compromise. Now, we obviously saw at the beginning of this year the uh, TGX case where 46, uh, uh, just short of 46 million credit card details were stolen, and that database compromise had been uh, two years, basically, in, in, in the... In the the offing. So, obviously, it's the largest breach uh, known so far. Um, and I say no, known so far because, of course, we don't know whether there's other databases out there that have been compromised and people just don't know what to look for and they just think everything's hunky dory. So, if we look at the statistics, since these database breach laws have been um, introduced, in the, the first three months of uh, this year, there, there are 85 breaches, which, if uh, projected, is going to obviously beat 2006, 2005, and, and, and so on. Now, in, in all fairness, uh, these publicized breaches do not necessarily just involve database compromises. They may include a, um, a lost or stolen laptop, for example. So without, um, it's unfortunate that uh, the, 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 the source of this data doesn't define whether the, the, the breach, has been, you know, breach has occurred due to a lost laptop or an actual database compromise. So, given that the law, certainly in 35 states, tells someone that in the event of a compromise, you have to alert your customers to that fact, how do you know whether there's been a successful compromise or not? Well, one would think you could just go buy or download a, a, a tool to, to do an Oracle forensic analysis of, uh, sorry, a uh, uh, forensic analysis of your database server. But as far as I can see, there are zero tools out there that do this kind of thing. There are tools that can be clutched in a sort of half, well, certainly not in a forensically sound way, but there are tools you can do to certainly ascertain whether they've been compromised or not. Um, but by running these tools, you might end up invalidating any evidence. Now, as an example of this, um, LogMiner can be used to read the redo logs on, on Oracle. But to do that, you've got to alter, alter the system to, to be able to get access to the, um, to the uh, redo logs themselves. So in the act of doing that, that's going to change the system in a fairly dra uh, drastic way, which could potentially um, cause any evidence to be viewed upon uh, skeptically in a court of law. Now, um, added to that, LogMiner itself um, will not show, for example, um, the text of DDL operations, DDL being data definition language, things such as create procedure, drop table, or whatever. So there are, there are shortcomings to LogMiner. Uh, you could use um, BBED, you know, the, um, the, the tool that Oracle used to supply um, to examine data files, but because BBED has write capabilities, how, how you know, how, how would you then go about proving, once you've examined a data file using BBED, that there was no alteration going on there? So uh, there are tools that, you know, you sort of can cludge and fudge your way through an, an analysis. But um, suffice it to say that they, uh, by, by running these tools, you can uh, potentially damage evidence. So specifically with Oracle, where is the evidence uh, going to be found? Well you know, pretty much where you're going to expect it to be found. In the log files is a good start. But beyond that, 
um, there are the, the transaction files, what's uh, known as the redo logs in Oracle. And there's the archived redo logs as well, which are sort of, you know, the backup version of, of the redo logs. The data files themselves provide a wealth of information with regards to, you know, compromises. The, the metadata and uh, statistics that are recorded in, in the data files. And obviously, if there's a, you know, an Oracle application server stuck in front of the Oracle database server, the Apache web logs themselves will provide an enormous um, wealth of information. The talk today is specifically going to concentrate on data files, redo logs, and we'll, um, in there we'll be looking for evidence of the creation and the dropping of objects um, and so on. Now, that's all well and good if, if a user starts, you know, or an attacker, not, uh, not a user, if they start creating objects, you know, the, these things are fairly easy to find. But if, if they're just doing a, a select, for example, your, your website might be vulnerable to SQL injection and they do a select to dump credit card information, you know, a union select to dump credit card information of all your users on your website. How would you go about finding, you know, in the absence of auditing, that someone actually formed a select there? And let's say the, the, uh, the inject point was via post data and you're not logging post data on your, um, your web server, then unless you've got a sniffer running or some other means of doing this, you're never going to find out if someone's done a select such as that. Well, that's what we'll be looking at um, at the end of the, the talk, is ways to ascertain whether someone has stolen data through select statements. So first, first and foremost, though, we're going to look at uh, data files, uh, specifically the metadata in there. So we're going to start off with the Oracle data block. OK. Database server needs to store data somewhere. That goes in the data files. The data files themselves are split up into a variable chunk size. Now, the, uh, the, the, stand, uh, the, the, the default is, is 8,000 bytes on, on, a, uh, on a Windows box. And each block of data has this kind of format. The gray, I'm colorblind, so I hope I've got the colors right here. The, the gray at the, at the very top is um, the, the header. Below that is a table directory, and uh, that's the light gray. The yellow thing is the row directory. We'll speak about more about the row directory in, in a second. Data itself grows from the bottom of the data block upwards towards the, the header. And the row directory grows downwards towards the, towards the row data itself. In between is free space. Now, what is this row directory? The row directory basically is a bunch of two-byte entries that point to an offset into the, into the, um, the, the row data. Does any, um, do we have a, a laser pointer, actually, at all? Any chance of getting a laser pointer? Great, thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. So, in here are and here are two bytes. Um, uh, it's a directory of two byte sections, basically that um, are an offset into this section here, and the offset is starts from the the beginning of the row directory. So, if we see in there, for example. Um, two bytes being um, OX1758, uh, then we just add that to there and we can find the beginning of our, of our row. Each row of data in the, in the, in, in the row data uh, block has uh, a three-byte header. The first byte indicates the row state. So, for example, if, if the row has been deleted, the fifth bit of the first byte uh, of the flags, in other words, it's set. So OX2C will become OX3C. So that way, very quickly, we can ascertain whether, if we're looking at a given row, whether it's been deleted or not. The second byte, uh, you know, we can ignore for the purposes of this uh, discussion, but the, the byte number three, um, tells us the number of columns in, in the given row. After that, the, the row data itself occurs. 
Now, the, the first column, obviously a, a, a row of data is split up into columns. The, the, the column length of the, the first column is preceded by the number of bytes uh, as specified by the column length. So here we can see uh, column one. Uh, this is an example row of data. The first number is 04. This is after the, the row header, by the way. First number is 04. And that indicates there are four, four bytes of data that fill this column. So C306132F there. And once we get, you know, count four bytes in, we then know the next thing we're going to come across is the length of the next column. So it's 04, so we count four more in. And then the next one is 02, so we count two more in. And then uh, 0D, so we count OX 0D bytes in, and so on. Unless we come across an FF. FF simply represents null. It's always one byte, and you don't proceed it with um, the length. So you don't go 0, 1, FF. Um, so we, we trace that all the way through, and obviously by the time we get to the very end, this number here should equal the number of bytes in the row header. It's, um, sorry, uh, the number of columns counted should match up with the, um, the number of columns as specified in the row her header. So that's when we know when to stop. Okay, so let's say someone comes along and compromises someone's database server and they start creating objects. Um, a typical attack, um, for example, in Oracle um, would be where an, a, there's a PL SQL uh, package or procedure which is vulnerable to SQL injection and let's say it's owned by Sys and uses definer rights. In other words, when someone executes that procedure or, or package, it executes with the privileges of the Sys user. Now, Sys being DBA, being God essentially on that database server, if it's vulnerable to the SQL injection flaw, then an attacker can come along and inject SQL that will execute as the Sys user and allow them to gain complete control of that database server. Now, a, a typical way an attacker might exploit that is if they have the create procedure privilege, for example, um, Scott or anyone with the connect role, um, they can come along create their own nefarious uh, function, stick it, you know, uh, specify a pragma of uh, autonomous transaction, uh, create the, uh, the function as auth ID current user. So when it's injected, when this function is injected into the, um, the sys owned procedure, it will um, gain the privileges of sys temporarily. And in there they specify, for example, execute immediate grant DBA to public or you know, do something equally nefarious. So an attacker in the course of compromising a system might go around creating objects. And after they've, uh, you know, created these objects, done whatever they want to do, they might go after themselves and clean up to, to attempt to hide any evidence of the, the, their presence. So if we were to spend some time looking for these dropped objects, if indeed they did drop them, if, if they... If, if, of course, they didn't drop them, then they're there for, you know, easy to see. If they did, of course, drop them, then w we can go around hunting them. But before we can start hunting them, we need to work out what happens when you go around creating an object. So, essentially, you know, the, the, the first obvious thing is a, a row is entered into the obj dollar table. The obj dollar table is obviously where um, every object is tracked in Oracle. Again, a wee bit of feedback here. Um, not only that, but...